Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Quorum Podcast, brought to you by the College of Remote and Offshore Medicine. Today, we have Dr. Edit Gara, who is an MD, PhD from Budapest, who will be discussing austere cardiology. So welcome, everyone, to QuorumCast. Today's episode is about chest pain and shortness of breath. So wherever you are at the moment, maybe you are commuting, maybe you are in your car, or just having a walk and listening to a podcast, you're here to advance your knowledge and to have continuous development. And it's also important to know that repetition is matter studiorum est, so it's always important to refresh and update our knowledge. And it's uh, crucial in the medical field and in the emergency field as day-to-day new novel data are out. So today's topic is chest pain and shortness of breath. Both are extremely common symptoms and extremely frequent in the medical field, being in remote or austere conditions, doing general medicine, doing cardiology or pulmonology or internal medicine. But even in the surgery department, many patients can complain about some chest pain, chest sensation, and also shortness of breath. So it's really important that the medical team, the responders, are familiar with these symptoms, are familiar with the differential steps and the diagnostic tools. And of course, these symptoms and the diagnosis is even more challenging in remote conditions. Today, there are clear diagnostic pathways and diagnostic steps to rule out or to rule in the pathology behind the chest pain and shortness of. So in a nutshell, these two major symptoms are really frequent and we have lots of data and lots of a diagnostic tool at our hands. So at first, it sounds an easy case, an easy scenario when the patient is having chest pain because it's so common and we have so much experience. But many, many times, of course, there are twists and turns and tricky diagnostic steps and tricky pathologies behind these symptoms. So first things first, I would like to outline that in the phrase chest pain, many other chest sensations, chest feelings are counted. So most of the times, patients with these symptoms, they don't complain about effective pain. So they don't say that this is a pain. They say something else that I have some strange feeling in the middle of my chest. Sometimes they they say that this is a discomfort. Sometimes they say that they have a burning sensation. This could be heartburn. Sometimes they have some chest heaviness. Sometimes they are just burping and have some different feeling than the normal in the chest. So there's a really wide palette of feelings and of sensations and the verbal words which patients tell you at the field, really uh, they cover a wide palette. So be really careful and according to our pain protocol, ask the patient what is the onset, what is the provocation, is it radiating, what is the timing, etc to make sure that you have the whole picture of this symptom. Because as a cardiologist, yeah, I've seen tons of patients with heart infarct and there are some who are just telling you that I'm burping or I'm just not the whole, I'm just not feeling myself normal. So not all patients have the typical chest pain uh, in an MI. Okay, so let's go on with the pathology behind chest pain. And here, first things first, I would like to outline the three major cardiovascular causes, cardiovascular diseases behind a chest pain, which is the deadly triad. And unfortunately, these three major cardiovascular events, they have a really high rate of mortality. So they are presumably fatal conditions. What are these three major cardiovascular events? The acute coronary syndrome, it's a big group. Then the next one is the pulmonary embolism. And the third one is the aortic dissection. These three 
as remote medics and as as uh, paramedics, pre-hospital cares, physiologists, whoever you are listening at the moment, you you must have really deep knowledge and uh, also hands-on experience with handling these free conditions. In our podcast series, my future podcasts will cover all of these conditions in details. So today I don't want to go into the diagnosis and the treatment of an acute coronary syndrome PE or an aortic dissection. I would say that kind of from the side of the medic, the diagnostic steps are easier than something else going on in the chest, causing chest pain and chest sensation. Because the diagnostic pathways are really clear, we have lots of experience and we know what to do with a patient in an ACS, PE or aortic dissection. The problem is when you are in a remote or oyster conditions, because unfortunately, these uh, all three are really time sensitive conditions. So the sooner you can get the definitive treatment for your patient, the, the better the survival rate is. And uh, up to date, the, the ACS warrants a coronary angiogram, a PE, a thrombolysis or surgery and an aortic dissection, um, definitely a surgery if available. All right. So we will discuss all three in the upcoming month in the podcast series. Okay. So the twists and turns come when the medic have ruled out these three major cardiovascular events and something else is going on and causing the chest pain for your patient. It's um, possible to group the pathologies. One way to group the pathologies behind, whether is it a cardiovascular cause or a non-cardiovascular cause. Other grouping methods say that whether it's a thoracic pathology or an extra thoracic pathology. Is it the stomach? Is it from the lungs? Okay, so today I would go for the grouping of the cardiovascular or non-cardiovascular causes and I would go through these. So cardiovascular causes of a chest pain besides the three major cardiovascular events, it's worth to mention a pericarditis and also a myocarditis. Pericarditis, myocarditis, unfortunately, in the COVID era, they are more frequent than they used to before, because before COVID was the disease of the young adults or youngsters after some viral infection or a gastrointestinal infection, diarrhea, mostly Epstein-Barr virus can cause pericarditis and gastrointestinal viruses can also cause. It's a quite heavy chest pain, chest sensation. If it's a pericarditis, then with the movement, it can change. It can radiate really heavily to the back of the patient as well. In the remote and ulcer conditions, unfortunately, it's really difficult to do the differential and to exclude an acute coronary syndrome, even the troponin, if you have a bad side, quick troponin test, even it can be positive, it will be definitely positive in myocarditis, it can be positive in the pericarditis or in a gray zone. So you you will even have a, a trop pause patient. Yeah, so for the definitive diagnosis, it warrants a negative coronary angiogram. All right. Next step to move to the non-cardiovascular causes. And here it's a wide range of possibilities. Common are the gastroesophageal reflux cases. So those take up a huge slice from the chest uh, symptoms. Uh, they usually say it's a burning sensation, but it's also a bit heavy, a bit tight chest. Uh, many, 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 many patients come into the cardiology ambulance with reflux-related symptoms, and fortunately, they turn out not to having a cardiac disease. It can be, of course, non-cardiovascular. It could be from the lungs. Severe pneumonia can cause severe chest pain then. Trauma patients definitely they have they can have chest pain. It can be a PTX. Sometimes it's a spontaneous PTX in youngsters who are thin and have this phenotype of thin, tall patients 
who suffer spontaneous PTX with heavy pain. Then again, many patients and elderly population are complaining about muscular pains and musculoskeletal chest wall pains. Also, reuma patients or pre-reuma state can cause strange chest sensations. And uh, these kind of musculoskeletal pains and inflammation of those tiny musculoskeletal joints in the thorax, these conditions can last up to a couple of months. So they are chronic diseases having severe impact on the everyday life of these patients. The quality of life is decreased for the reason of this pain. And yeah, they by time to time they end up at cardiology departments because they feel that their symptoms are so heavy that it cannot only be some musculoskeletal pain. So it's important to to rule out these patients. Okay, what else? Of course, unfortunately, the oncology patients, there's a tumor in the thorax or even in the uh, extrathoracic space, it can cause severe chest pain. Then also quite common is the so-called herpes zoster disease, which is a viral condition, heavy, heavy chest pain. It's not from within the organs, but it's on the surface, on the skin, and you will always have the skin symptoms, so it's easy to diagnose and to rule out from other conditions. Okay, it can be an esophageal rupture, fortunately not so frequent, mostly related to oncology conditions or severe hepatic conditions. So we have covered the cardiovascular and non-cardiovascular causes of chest pain. From here, we move to the shortness of breath. And again, shortness of breath is extremely frequent symptom. All of the medics uh, have hands-on experience, wide experience with patients with uh, shortness of breath. Here, there is no such big deadly triad as with the chest pain. Those three, the ACS, the PE, and the aortic dissection can also present with some form of shortness of breath as well. When you diagnose a shortness of breath, I would say that you can follow or you can investigate speed of onset, the associated symptoms, and the associated signs. And from these free extra information, you will be able to go down the diagnostic pathway and to come up with a presumably diagnosis of your patient. So on the speed of onset, whether it's in sudden or it's minutes, hours or days, weeks, months or intermittent, there are lots of information. So sudden onset is usually an acute PE, an uh, arrhythmia, a PTX or an anaphylaxis. A uh, minute, it could be an angina, an MI, a PE, or an asthma. If uh, the onset was hours, days, then it's more, took up a bit of time for the disease to cause this symptom. Then you can think about a pneumonia, you can think about an uh, acute exacerbation of COPD, you can think about an acute exacerbation of heart failure or a pleural effusion, which takes time to collect weeks, months, it could be a constrictive cardiomyopathy causing the patient an ongoing and worsening shortness of breath. It could be complex pulmonary diseases such as pulmonary fibrosis or a chronic uh, PE. If it's intermittent, then it could be an arrhythmia, it could be an asthma, it could be an allergic asthma. Yes. Okay. For the associated symptoms, you can go through and ask detailed questions, whether it's associated with chest pain, palpitation, wheeze, orthopnea or paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, sweats, cough, hemoptysis, or whether the patient is hyperanxious, you can just associate the previously mentioned pathologies with these associated symptoms, and this will help you diagnose. So for example, asthma is associated with wheezing, palpitation is associated with arrhythmia or heart failure, then cough or sputum is associated with pneumonia, okay? And of course, you do a really thorough 
physical examination and you look for signs of stridor, an elevated jugular vein pressure, look for signs of cyanosis, clubbing, crackles, cardiac murmur, also really informative, or whether the patient is clammy or pale, and you collect, and from these mosaic of informations, you put together all of the information you have, and you come up with a diagnosis. Again, it's possible to group the shortness of breath for cardiovascular and non-cardiovascular reasons. And in the finishing part of this podcast, I will go through these. So the cardiovascular reasons of shortness of breath could be a PE, could be arrhythmias, could be an acute coronary syndrome. Of course, it could be left ventricular failure, whether it's acute or chronic. It could be a chronic cardiomyopathy. It could be arrhythmia, especially uh, atrial fibrillation is often presented in uh, shortness of breath. It could be pulmonary hypertension as well. All right. The non-cardiovascular causes of shortness of breath are, uh, of course, the already mentioned pneumonia, COPD, asthma, a PTX, pleural effusion, then an upper airway obstruction, immediate care needed. It could be oncology reasons, tumors within the lungs or the chest wall. It could be, it's important to mention the anemia. It's When it's severe, it's presented in shortness of breath. It also could be thyroid disease and thyroid toxicosis is often presented in shortness of breath. Some metabolic conditions, metabolic acidosis can cause shortness of breath. Then the anxiety or psychogenic reason is, I would say, that's the last remaining diagnosis. So if when you ruled out everything else, then if the patient is presented in an anxious state and seems to have some uh, psychological problems, then you come up that this is an anxiety, shortness of breath. Okay, so in to sum up, in today's podcast, we have covered chest pain and shortness of breath. Uh, I have outlined the three major deadly triad from uh, behind the uh, chest pain, which are ACS, PE, and aortic dissection. And then we have gone through the cardiovascular and non-cardiovascular reasons of chest pain and or shortness of breath. So they might come together or they presented individually. All right. So I'm really happy that you have enjoyed me today for this podcast. Please, if you have time in the afternoon or in the end of the day, open your emergency care book, whatever you have, or open the quorum field guide and look through the diagnostic pathways and also the investigations needed and just refresh your knowledge let's stay together in our next podcast episode as well have a lovely day this has been a presentation from the college of remote and offshore medicine foundation if you would like to earn free cpd credit for this podcast you can join the council of members being a member of the college gives you free cpd credits free access to the virtual field guide and discounts on our e-learning courses you can join the team on the college website which is quorum c-o-r-o-m quorum.org